four, I mean, 30, 73. It says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It is good for me to draw near to God. I've put my trust in the Lord that I might declare your works. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for drawing us together, gathering us as your church and as a family to be able to proclaim your praises and to declare our dependence upon you. Help us, Lord, as we sing and as we pray, as we read and as we hear your word preached, to recognize our own failure, our own faults and um, inabilities, but also to rejoice in your glory and in your power and in your strength that lifts us up out of our darkness and raises us into a new life in your son, Jesus. I pray that you'd uh, help us to sing powerfully, help us to pray intentionally, and help us to receive your word in a way that transforms us. In the name of Christ, amen. This morning we have some uh, guest instrumentalists with us. Uh, And so they're going to start us off by playing through a verse of Jesus Hold My Hand, and then we're going to join in with them. So um, I hope that you enjoy this uh, bluegrass crew this morning. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me, leads me safely through the sinking sand. It is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea, O Lord, look down on me. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Let me travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy, thine and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly take a stand. As I onward go and daily meet the foe, blessed Jesus, take my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea. setting of the sun. Lead me 
safely to a land of rest If I a crown of life have won I have put my faith in thee, O Lord That I may reach the golden strand There's no other friend on whom I can depend Jesus, Jesus, hold my hand Jesus, hold my hand Please be seated.
Thank you, choir. Good morning. good morning. Boy, it sure is good to walk to the pulpit today. <laughs> I bless the Lord, thanking Him for miracles. I'm glad that you're here this morning in the house of the Lord. God has surely been good to us. Someone says, God's been good to me when the sun is shining. But I want to tell you something, God's still good even when it's raining. And I hate to say it even when it's snowing. But uh, God is so good and I'm thankful that He has blessed us the way that He has. And I'm so thankful that you're here with us this morning. There's a bulletin full of information. Pastor Mike may share more about life groups. They begin this week. We are very excited about life groups. If you have not got plugged into one yet... You need to stop by today and sign up so we'll know that you're coming this week. And if you can't make it this week, maybe you can make it next week. But we have several classes that's going to be taking place Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights. And we're excited about these classes. We want to make sure you get a chance to be a part of these classes. Just before I pray today, I'd like to introduce three people for church membership. And I'm going to ask them to stand today. They will take a motion from our body to receive these three as members. The first one is Miss Jean back over here. We're so thankful that God has brought her our way. And the next is this dear sweet couple we've got to meet Deo and Faiza. And we're going to ask them to stand if they would. And we have talked to all three of these. And we read them the church covenant. And they promised God being their helper, they would abide by this covenant. And so today it's a joy for me to recommend them to Heritage Church. I need a motion from this body to receive them as members. I have about three motions back there, about four or five seconds, and we'll take them all. God bless you. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I didn't think so. That's wonderful. And so, amen. Welcome them to church this morning. Would you do that? I'd like to ask the three of you, when my wife and I greet visitors at the door after church today, would you join us so the entire church body can greet you as well? Thank you and welcome to Heritage. We're so thankful that you're a part of our church. I am uh, thrilled today to have a friend. I did not know my dear friend was going to be with us this morning. He's on vacation, and he and his wife popped in to visit with us, and it is a joy to have my mom's pastor with us today. Brother Bill Crank and his wife Lorraine are here from Cornerstone Free Will Baptist Church. Brother Bill, would you come to the pulpit and lead us in prayer today? It's such a joy to have you all with us today. This guy has been a, um, a pastor to my family. And uh, during the time of my dad st- suffered so hard, during those days he was right there with us. And uh, he proved his heart. And uh, I love him. And I want you to make him welcome today. It's so good to have he and his good wife with us. Would you pray for us, my friend? I love you, buddy. Father, it's good to be saints of God gathered together in your name to worship you. It's good to be here today. It's good to feel your presence and know that, Lord, when we brought you, there are others that brought you. And, Lord, that, that sweet spirit that abides among the church is with us. I pray that you'd help us today. Father, pour out a blessing upon our brother as he brings the word in a little while upon the singers as they sing. But God, help us as we worship not to be spectators, but to be worshipers as well. Bless us today, Lord. We need your help. And Father, if there's anybody here that needs to do business with you, I know this church's heart. I know this pastor's heart. And Lord, I know that that's what they're begging you for, that that person or people would respond to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Bless you. Amen. I'm going to sing together one of my favorite songs, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I want you to sing it out this morning. I want you to sing about that great love. But just before we sing about him, I'd like to say it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. And if you're visiting with us, you have honored us with your presence. Thank you for being here. There's a connection card in the pew in front of you. If you'll take time to fill that card out, just give us an idea who you are. Uh, fill out the pertinent information and take it to the Welcome Center. I'll be standing there when church is over this morning. If you'll bring it to me, I have a gift for you. All right? If you don't bring it to me, I may not have a gift for you. But if you bring it, I'll have something for you this morning that I think that you will enjoy, okay? Let's stand together. Musicians, would you play for us, please? And uh, then Pastor Jacob will come and lead us in our congregational song.
as we sing one more song. I'm thine, O Lord.
you so much, Brother Jacob. I want to uh, I want to thank you if you did come out. We had our Upward Awards this last Thursday, and uh, to, we had 291 was the count of people that was able to hear the gospel this week. And uh, just pray that the gospel seed sticks in their hearts, and the Lord gets the increase. Um, we had a great Upward season. Don't worry, we'll be back next year. So if you missed it, you got your chance next year to see more of it. Okay, uh, so thank you so much for those who came out. I do want to mention that the Golden Seniors are going to BD's Mongolian Grill this Tuesday. The bus is leaving at 1045. If you plan on going, please make sure you sign up by today. It's the last day to sign up for that. Also, I am so ex- Listen, y'all. I'm excited life groups are starting this week. I've been looking forward to it. I have been, I have been studying. I, have, I, I am so looking forward to life groups starting this week. And uh, if you have not been a part of life groups... I'm going to tell you something. You're missing a blessing. You know, the, uh, the, I taught the teenagers a few weeks back on the importance of going to church, why we should go to church. And I use the same illustration. I'll use it with you. The Lord knew what he was doing when he told the believers to come together. How many of y'all have never had a bad week? Yeah, see, we all have had bad weeks. And we all sometimes need that little extra encouragement. And life groups are just that tool. It's a chance for you to get with other believers in a group and be encouraged by one another. That other people share disappointments and problems just like you. As well as learn God's word and dig deeper into God's word that you just, sometimes you just cannot get anywhere else. That you just need that community, you need that fellowship, and that building of relationships with one another. So let me encourage you, number one, to be in church on Sunday morning, so I'm glad you're here already if you're here. But number two, join a life group today. Sign up, go back there, find a sheet, sign up. If you don't know what we're having, it's on the website at heritagefwb.com. It's on our church app. It's on the back of your bulletin if you got a bulletin, and it's on the wall there. So there's no reason why you say, I didn't know we were having it. This, but that, that crazy young guy up there was telling me all about him. All right, so make sure you join a life group. They start this week. We're looking forward to that. But I do want to read a passage of Scripture as the ushers come forward. This passage has just meant something to me this week, and it's in Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. I bet y'all, some of y'all didn't even know that was in the Bible. But it's Zephaniah chapter 3. And this whole chapter and this whole book is written um, to, to God's people about a future promise and a future restoration that they would have. But as a believer, I want you to know that this has a promise to us for hope and restoration in our lives as well. All right? In my Bible, it's on page 868. I don't know what it is on yours. But in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Sing for joy, daughter Zion, and shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned your back, turned back your enemy. The King of Israel, Yahweh, is among you. You need no longer fear harm. Here it goes. And on that day will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. Yahweh your God is among you. He is a warrior who saves. I love that line. God is my warrior who saves. I, I don't know what you're going through, but somebody needed that this morning. God is a warrior who saves today. All right? He fights for you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will bring quietness with his love. He loves you, church. He will delight in you with shouts of joy. He is joyful for you. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals, and they will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yes, at that time, I will deal with all those who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather the scattered. I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at that time, I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth. Here we go. Here is the Lord. If there is anything, here is God's mic drop moment. All right. Y'all, y'all know what a mic drop is, right? When a speaker's talking and they just put the mic out, they say something profound and just drops the mic. Here it goes. You ready? When I restore your fortune before your eyes, here it is. The Lord has spoken. And that's the end of the book. Here's what he says. He says, one day, church, there's hope. There's restoration. Whatever problems you're going through, he is a warrior who saves. And to end this book, he just simply says, that's it. The Lord has spoken. And it's almost as if he dropped them, dropped the mic right there. And when the Lord speaks, that settles it. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. We thank you so much that you want to give us hope, joy, love. You want to restore us, Father. You want to save it. Lord, you are a warrior who saves us. You are one who fights for us. And I thank you so much for that. Father, I pray for us as a church now that we would faithfully love you, serve you, Lord. May your spirit enter into our hearts today. Father, if we are not a believer, Father, if we are believers today, Father, I pray our hearts would be open and receptive to your spirit and your leading today from your word. Father, bless the offering. Father, may it be you for your kingdom. Lord, may we give not only of, of our finances, Father, but maybe, but Father, may we give of our, of our future. Father, may we give of ourselves, Father, today. And Lord, may be for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Kids, come on up real quick. Come on up. I'm excited today because we get to talk about one of my favorite, I say that about a lot of Bible stories, but this is one of my favorite stories. And um, if you go to SCA this week, if you're in here and you're at Hamilton High School or Hamilton Middle School, you're going to hear the same thing. So, you know, be prepared. But the Bible teaches in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus was tempted. Boys and girls, did you know that? Did you know that Jesus can be tempted, that Jesus was tempted on earth too? All right, now this was after Jesus went 40 days without eating. I couldn't go four hours without eating. All right, but Jesus went 40 days without eating, and then he was tempted. But you know what? He did something to the devil that we need to learn to do too. And that's Jesus used scripture. So today we're going to talk a little bit about why it's important to know God's word so that when temptation comes we want to hit our brother or sister we want to disobey our parents because i know none of our none of our kids do that right we want to do whatever we can do that goes against what god wants us to do how we can use scripture to help us all right so parents grandparents everybody out there in the church again i want to say this every week and i'm gonna keep saying it find a kid i want you to pray for them today during church today so they know that somebody is praying for them as they hear God's word. All right? Boys and girls, you are dismissed. Nothing more, nothing more intimidating than playing guitar in a church full of guitar players. Uh, this is a song. Uh, it's sung around uh, Easter a lot of times. But uh, it's really a song about Peter. And uh, when you look at Peter's life, especially early on, 
you see him uh, making mistakes. And that's the one thing about the Bible is that it doesn't hold back. It shows the humanity and uh, the fallacy of man, and, and yet uh, you see that uh, great things come out of these people that make mistakes. And when they have these awful things that they do in their lifetime, it seems like when they come through that, on the other side, greater things come out of that. Uh, Peter denied Christ, and it was devastating to him. And uh, he watched his best friend tortured and murdered. And then that feeling that must have been going through his heart and his very being, how he ached. And I think about myself and my shortcomings and how I fail. And I think about that. And then, you know, there Christ is with his open arms. And you you just, you never get over that if we're honest with ourselves. So I'm going to sing a song. Uh, You've probably all heard this before. I always pull stuff out of the 70s, it seems like. Gates and doors are barred And all the windows fastened down Spent the night in sleeplessness And rose at every sound Half in hopeless sorrow Half in fear the day We find the soldiers breaking through To drag us all away Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. Gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches, sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they moved him in the night and none of us knows where. That stone's been rolled away, now his body is in there. Both ran toward the garden And then John ran on ahead We found the stone in the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said But the winding sheet they wrapped him in Was just an empty shell As to how or where they'd taken him Was more than I could tell Something strange had happened there Just what I did not know John believed a miracle But I just turned to go Circumstance and speculation Couldn't lift me very high Cause I seen them crucify him and Then I saw him Back inside that house again The guilt and anguish came Everything I promised him Just added to my shame When at last it came The choices I denied I knew his name And even if he was alive Was 
Suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume Light that came from everywhere and drove shadows from the room Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide I fell down on my knees and clung to him and cried He raised me to my feet as I looked into his eyes Love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies Guilt and fright, confusion disappeared in sweet release And every fear I'd ever had and just melted into peace Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Let me get my eyes cleaned back out again. Thank you, Brother Steve, for that great song. Amen. Brother Jacob, I won't need a chair today. Amen. What if I said, let's turn to the book of Psalm? You wouldn't get mad at me, would you? Not chapter 85. I think we spent six weeks in chapter 85. Today we're going to Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Brother Loveless, good to see you back there today, my friend. Good to see you. I've been praying for you. Psalm 101. Keep your Bibles open as we do the exposition of the text today. I want to preach a message simply titled, Behave Yourself. Let me put my glasses on just a minute. I want to ask a question. How many of you have ever, have ever had somebody say to you, behave yourself? Would you raise your hand? Do you think you needed it? Would you keep your hand up there? <laughs> I remember the first time I heard that word. My dad and mom may have used that word, but my junior Sunday school teacher, uh, Brother Branham, Ray Branham, uh, used to tell us boys, behave yourself, boys, behave yourself. And he would even though he was a humble type kind of a guy, he would speak and we would listen. And uh, I've learned what it is to behave ourselves. Psalm 101, beginning in verse number 1, we'll read all eight verses this morning. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that dwelleth lies, or he that telleth lies, shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land. 
that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Father, would you help us to preach today the message that you've given to us. May our hearts be listening to you as you speak from the scriptures. And I pray, Father, that you'll work in all of us for that unsaved man, woman, boy, or girl that's in this service today. And those in junior church, would you help us to hear what thus saith the Lord. The Lord hath spoken. Would you help us today, God, to be able as Christians to see the responsibilities we have to set an example? And would you help all of us, Lord, to just do what's right? When the question comes, Lord, help us to just always do what's right. Even if the stars fall from the sky, God help us to do what's right, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of us know Psalm 101 very well, and, and I, I'm not sure the chronological order here of Psalm 100 and then 101. I know numerically they fit there. But it's been said there are two kinds of psalm. One's a psalm of praise and one is a psalm of practice. And I believe what we see in Psalm 100 is a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of praise and psalm of thanksgiving. And praise helps us get beyond the problem. Many people have problems in their life. And when they begin to praise, they understand, they learn that praise turns the problem into a minor thing. David tells us in Psalm 100 how to praise the Lord. You know the psalm very well, so I'll not go back and read it. But if you think about it, he said, we give him praise through the singing or the sounds or the KJV word is the noise we produce. Then he also says we give him praise by serving him with gladness, by coming before him with thanksgiving and praise, by blessing his name and making known his deeds among the people. So there's a psalm of praise in Psalm 100. But in Psalm 101, we find an example of practice. Psalm 101 is full of resolutions made by David at a time when he was just about to become the king of Israel. I want you to think about this as a, a preface to the message this morning. When we praise, we focus on the promise. But when we pick apart, we focus on a problem. I'm going to say it again. I want you to think about it. When we praise, we focus on the promise. But when we pick apart, we focus on the problem. I would just be very simply... Open with my heart right here. For, I want you to hear this. I want you to understand this as we introduce the message. I'm thankful for all the kind comments that people share when they leave the church. Sometimes people will say, boy, that message really challenged me. That message spoke to my heart. That message, that message just was what I needed today. And I might have 25 or 30 people that would walk out the door and shake my hand and say, God just really used you. And it was really a touching message. And then one person walk out the door and snarl at you and say, can't you do any better than that? And I'll tell you, it don't matter how many told you how great it was. I've done lost my appetite for Sunday dinner because of the one that just didn't know how to be right in their speech. You see, there's a psalm of praise and then a psalm that tells us about how to live. It's easy to praise the Lord because every one of us has something great to praise Him about today. I mean, we could talk about salvation. We could talk about sustenance. We could talk about supply. We could talk about His goodness and His grace and all that God has done for us. And we'd be on our feet, raising our hands toward heaven, shouting glory, hallelujah, to the Lamb of God because God has been so good to all of us. Amen. But then we come to our behavior and the tide changes just a little bit. Both of these psalms have to do with daily life and conduct. That's why the psalm is so practical. One of my favorite things that Warren Wiersbe said many years ago is right doctrine produces right living. And when we have right doctrine teaching us how to praise and be practical, I believe it will teach us how to live. Several times in this chapter in our KGV text, we find David saying, I will. Just notice with me very quickly through the chapter. Verse 1, I will. Later on in that same verse, he says, will I. Verse 2, I will. He says also in that verse 2, I will. Verse 3, I will. Verse 4, I will. Verse 5, will I. And then he says, will not I. Verse number 8, I will. Several times he comes to us and he makes this very personal when he went from telling us what to do and how to practice daily life. 
You see, many people I talk to fail to understand that things that happen to us are not always an act of punishment from God, but sometimes just a part of life. Life, <laughs> excuse me, life is more than a board game. It's a real thing that we have to adjust to ourselves. Not always do we get the good news. Not always do we have great things happen. Sometimes we have some storms, we have some battles, we have things we have to go through with. It's all a part of life. Birth is a part of life. And death is the unusual part of life. And we deal with these things and we say, boy, i got these issues and these problems with my life, but it's all a part of our life. In Him we live, we move, we have our very being. I believe the key text of this chapter is in verse number 2. He said, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you a Christian? Yes. I'm glad some of you said yes. I'm glad you could say amen. But I want to ask you a question, just me to you, and let your heart answer the question. Are you a Christian? Have you believed and confessed that God gave his son and his son was raised from the dead? Let me remind you what the plan of salvation is with the little old simple Romans road. We talk about it so often that we sometimes overlook what it says. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, the Bible said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that we've missed the target. We know that none of us have been able to just be what God intended for us to be because we are just not perfect. And whether you think you are or not, you're just not perfect. We also know that the wages of our sin is death. We will die because of our sin. But thank God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And that gift is a great gift God gave, but God commended his love toward us, and yet that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And all God asks us to do is to believe that. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, he might save you. Did I quote that wrong? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. You see, I, got, I get to go to heaven because I'm a good man. No. Boy, you all are hard to preach to today. You disagree with everything I'm saying. And you ought to. Because we're not going to heaven because of anything we do. We're going to heaven because of his goodness and his grace. Are you a Christian? If you are, you recall, it's because you went God's way. Now, let me ask you a second question with that. Are you a well-behaved Christian? When I ask that question, there are several things that come across my mind. First of all, in 1 Peter chapter 3, we're, talk, we're talk, told how that a woman that's a Christian can win her unsaved husband to the Lord. I've seen that several times in my ministry, how a Christian woman would want to pray for her unsaved husband. And the Bible takes six verses and shares this truth and says that she needs to have a good behavior that her husband might see Christ in her. It's amazing how we are to behave ourselves. So I want to show you several things this morning from the scripture that I believe teaches us to behave ourselves. First of all, number one, the well-behaved Christian has a spirit of praise. I'm just going to tell you something, and I don't mean to be hurting your feelings, and I don't mean to upset anybody, but if I'm around a person all the time that's just depressed, it gets depressing. Now, when you come into the church, and you're whistling Dixie, and you're, well, whatever, Amazing Grace, and, <laughs> and you're sort of happy, and you're smiling, it's just sort of easy to want to get up and rub shoulders with you a little bit. But all of us have seen people walk through the church, and you think, my goodness, they've lost their best friend. And you say, what happened? Huh, I stubbed my toe. I mean, sometimes it's a small thing, and, but yet it's a big thing. But we just have to stop and go back to praise. Notice what he said in verse 1. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. One of my great joys is not only seeing the PowerPoint screen that I might see the words of a song, but for me to stand here and look out through the congregation and watch you sing. 
I like when I watch you sing and you lift your voice and you just get your posture right so your voice will just flow on out. Some of you, bless your heart, you've been sucking on lemon juice before you started singing. Now, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to make a point. And my point is, a life that is filled with praise to God will end up being a well-behaved life. The important thing to notice here is the psalmist sings just as much of love as he does of justice. Because singing is going to lift your spirit. Naturally speaking, it's far easier to sing of love than it is of justice. It's easier to sing when the sun is shining and all is going well and that, that the grace of God enables his children to have a song in the night. I referenced the passage in Psalm 76, Psalm 77 verse number 6. When David said, I call to remembrance the song in the night. That long night when he was down and out and had struggles and problems, he began to sing the psalms where they brought great hope to him. We can even sing when we're in prison with our backs bleeding, Acts 16, 25. Paul and Silas were in Philippi in jail and they had been whooped and, 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 and punished. And they were singing songs of praise. God gives his people the ability to glorify him in the fires, Isaiah 24. And might I say, in all times, Psalm 34, 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. When life is pleasing, we often say, God is good. Listen carefully. But when trouble comes, we tend to forget to say it. And I'm one of those social networking persons that I, I watch people say this when they have a good day. It's sun is shining. God is good. But I want to tell you again, God is also good when it's snowing and raining. God is good when I'm able to walk out of the doctor's office. But God was just as good to me when I had to get on the knee scooter and scoot out of that doctor's office. I didn't like it as well, but God never changed. In his character, God does not change. He said, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. Therefore, God is always good. Amen. You say, but preacher, you don't know what I've gone through with. It don't matter. And I don't mean to belittle it. I'm just simply saying it don't matter what you go through with. That doesn't change God. God is always good. So let's do it right. God is good all the time. All the time. Amen. Amen. You didn't say it like you believed it. Amen. 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 When life is pleasing, God is still good. All the time, God is good. I remind you of Philippians 4, verse 6 is through 7. We are learning that praise can, be, uh, can, can bring peace to our life because we're to think and not be anxious about other things. We're to just trust in the Lord. The second thing I see in this text is in verse number 2. The well-behaved Christian lives consistently in the home. Let me stop just a second there. I want you to get the point. The well-behaved Christian lives consistently in the home. I've had people tell me that they wish their husbands and wives would act in church like they were at home so everybody could see what they really acted like. You're wondering if it's your family telling me, aren't you? Let's just be really honest about this this morning. Perhaps David had found, as we all have found, that the hardest place to live a sweet, consistent Christian life is in the home. In verse number two, he said, in the house. He said, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Walk within my house with a perfect heart. Because home is a place where we're apt to throw off self-control self restraints. Let me, let me share with you what I mean. If I have a bad day at work, I hate to say I have a bad day at the office because all my staff is here. But if I have a bad day doing something and something happens and I have to put on a smiley face for everybody around me to think that I'm happy as I can be, it's, it, it's possible that I'd go home and my wife say, how you doing? And I'd say, you just don't understand. And the one that I love the most, I'd become aggravated with my thoughts and my words and I just spit things out that I should never say. Now, I know that would never happen to you. But what we seem to do is the one we love the most we know will take, take it from us. And that does not make it right. So David makes the statement, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Behind the closed doors, how we react may be different than what we react in public. 
if we're careless and undisciplined in our living at home or where we work, the word of God is, is maligned or exposed to reproach. You see, if my wife, she knows what I am. I know what she is. You all don't see us at our house. You all don't uh, uh, know all about us. You say, Pastor, you got something to hide? No, I don't have anything to hide. I'm just simply telling you that sometimes we act a little different in private than we do in public. If you haven't figured that out yet, you've got to learn a little bit about life. Because life is that way. I remember when my, when <laughs> my boys were younger, we took them to a restaurant, a steakhouse. We couldn't afford steak, so this was a special occasion. And of all things, Tony and Stephen were acting up, and I think one of them turned the high chair over. And I looked at him, I said, I'll never take you boys out to eat in public again until you graduate from high school. Now, I did take him out again, but it was not steakhouse, it was McDonald's. More their speed at that time. I want to tell you something, not always do we act the way we ought to act. But David said, I will act right with my right behavior in my house. The third thing that I see is in verse number three. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. The well-behaved Christian refuses to regard iniquity. You see, we cannot help seeing vile things. And let me just throw this in for good measure. I I don't know what you watch on television, but I don't think that most of you let a man and a woman come in and have adultery in your house, so you better be careful what you put in through the TV screen. And some of the language, if they was to talk that kind of language in my house, I'd tell them to shut up or get out. But we allow it to come through on the TV screen. That didn't cost you any extra, by the way. I just want you to know that well-behaved Christians refuses to regard iniquity. We, we, we bring things into our home and we set things before our eyes that we should not. David said in Psalm 66, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In Romans 13, 14, he reminds us to, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make provision for the flesh. You say, what does that mean? I'm not to make provision for the lust of the flesh. I'm to protect my eyes. I'm to protect my ears. I'm to protect where I go that I do not give opportunity to the devil to tempt me with the lust of this world. Now, how necessary is it for us to make our minds up of verse 3 and to apply this to the things we read and the things that we see, the places we go? We're called unto holiness. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll get there in a few moments, but chapter 7 verse 1 reminds us that we are to come out from this world and be separate, saith the Lord. And he said, then I will receive you. In 2 Timothy 2.19, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And they that name the name of the Lord shall depart from iniquity. We sing songs about this. I shared this one on Facebook this week. This is a great old song. Take time to be holy, speak oft with the Lord. Always in him, always. Abide in him, always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be, thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Number four. The latter part of verse 3 says to us again that the well-behaved Christian is to separate himself from the spirit of this evil age. I want you to think about what David is saying. He's saying to us that he hates some things here. Look at verse four, verse 3 again. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. He's saying I'll not let a worldly spirit get a hold of me, a hold of me. Now, I want you to think of this. David's life is just now to the point that he's becoming king of Israel. He's just becoming king. His whole life is getting ready to change because if you see the things that he did as a king, it seemed like he forgot all about verse 3. But in studying this passage, I want you to look at his heart because in his heart he had determined some things, yet he let the devil put some things in front of him that messed him up big time. Brother Steve reminded us before his song today, even with the life of Peter, Peter had made some mistakes in denying the Lord Jesus Christ, yet God had a purpose for him. And God's got a purpose for many of you, and you say, but I've messed up my life so bad that God just won't even care. God still loves you. God still cares about you. 
And God still wants you as his own. And God still wants to use you in some capacity. No matter who you are or what you have done. You would say, Pastor, I murdered somebody. It don't matter. I mean, don't, don't take that wrong when I say it don't matter. It does matter. You're going to have to pay for that, I guess. But the fact is, God forgives you. God loves and cares and forgives. I don't have to know what's in your heart, but our God in heaven does know. It's easy for a Christian to become like a worldling, a person that is more interested in every material, everyday material things than in spiritual matters. I think we all get there. We all have things in this world that we want. We have things that we desire. We have things that we would long to have. I remember, I remember wanting a Cadillac. I wanted a Cadillac, and I saw one at the used car lot one day, and I wanted that car so bad that I came home and I cleaned my building outside, thinking I could sell that for $25. Toby Ann said, kids, get in here. Your daddy will sell you. <laughs> I thought, man, I, I just, I, it was only going to cost me $3,600. My old car wouldn't run. I went walking. I walked over a mile down to the car lot, and on the way there I was praying I'd find a $1,000 bill. I didn't even know they didn't make them. I mean, in my heart, I just wanted something so bad. Later in my life, I had a guy, I had an old 66 Ford twin I beam, three speed on the column truck. Man, that was the truck. A guy said, I need a truck to work with. He said, I've got this old Cadillac I'd like to trade you. Boy, my eyes lit up when I started that Cadillac up. It had a blown manifold gasket. You could hear it from here to kingdom come. I decided I'd drive it from North Carolina to Mansfield and show my dad. I left Mount Olive, North Carolina. It was so long, I was already halfway to Mansfield. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was a clunker is what it was. It was a clunker. But I had a Cadillac. I went out and got me a key ring on it. had Cadillac. I still got the key ring. The car's in the junkyard. But I thought, man, if I could just have a Cadillac, I would have arrived. I've, uh, I've made it. Boy, I've, I've made it in life if I've got a Cadillac. Never had a Cadillac since. And I don't need one. Now, if you have a leading in your heart to buy me one, <laughs> I'd drive that thing. I'd shine it up. I'd drive it. And I, but you understand what I'm saying? We all have things we want. You've got them. I've got them. But we've got to be careful about what we want. Because if we're not careful, we'll become like a worldly and we'll just crave all the things we want and we'll never want what God wants in our life. We need to practice the art of separation. Would you turn with me in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We don't generally take time to turn to all these passages, but I want to stop this morning and share a few things with you. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. I'll begin reading. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This passage is clear. The Old Testament passage reminds us of Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the things the king had offered to him. I'm simply telling us in this thought, the well-behaved Christian is separate from the spirit of this evil age. There's some things that you can have that may not seem godly. They're not sin to have. But don't let them have you. The fifth thing I see in this chapter is the well-behaved Christian is fully surrendered to the Lord. Now, if you really want to behave yourself, you've got to surrender to God. I want you to see this. In verse number 4, the Bible said, A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. The KGV word for forward is translated perverse in some other translations. And it means self-willed. Our wills are bent. And they're either bent toward pleasing ourselves or pleasing God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, the Bible talks about the way of man. 
I, I found an old song that I had never heard. I, I'm sure Pastor Jacob has heard this song. He knows all the songs. But this song I had never heard. And I'm going to give it to you in just a moment uh, on, your note, on the notes. I want to ask you a question. Are you living for yourself or are you living for him? And this hymn seems to sum up some of self and some of thee or none of self and all of thee. I want you to get this. It was written in 1875. I'll give you the verses and then the last line of each course will come up on the PowerPoint. Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me, I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day his tender mercy, healing, helping, full of free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heaven, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. Can we park here just a moment? I want you to see that again. All of self and none of thee is what many say. But as God begins to work, it's some of self and some of thee. And then we learn less of self and more of thee till finally we understand the fully surrendered Christian is none of self and all of thee. I am nothing and Christ is all. Amen. He must increase and I must decrease. You see, the more you decrease of yourself, the better your behavior is going to be. The more you decrease of what you are and what you think you are and what you think about, the more you'll be given to the Lord. My problem and your problem might be the same as we like ourselves. You say, boy, that's pretty bold. This facial, the Facebook thing, we social networking, we've all got what they call selfies. I'm not going to preach against selfies this morning, but I'm just going to simply say that we all seem to like the way we look. And if we don't, we try to cover it up in some form or fashion. The well-behaved Christian is fully surrendered, and it does not matter about us anymore. It matters about him. And so when someone comes to you and starts to fight with you and starts to argue with you, you can understand that the well-behaved Christian is the person that's surrendered to the Lord. That brings me to the sixth thing. We're just about done. The well-behaved Christian, number six, cultivates friends of whom God approves. When I got to this chapter, I looked at verse four, and I saw that passage that said, A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. I, I thought of that phrase, I will not know a wicked person. That means I will not make close friends of those who do not love the Lord. I want you to listen carefully because what I'm going to say can be confusing if you don't listen carefully. I believe the Lord's Bible tells us that if a man's going to have friends, he must show himself friendly. But when you're a Christian, you're going to have some things that are not going to be hunky-dory with a non-Christian. I believe every Christian ought to have non-Christian friends. Amen. Amen. Every Christian ought to have non-Christian friends. We're to be insulated, not isolated. If you have all your friends are Christian, you're missing out on some of the greatest opportunities of letting your light shine before people that's ever been done. You need non-Christian friends. But I want to remind you, when I say that in line with verse number four, when people are living wickedly and you associate with their wickedness, your behavior is judged by others thinking that you're just like them. You say, well, it don't matter what other people think. Only God knows. But the Bible does say something like this. Let not your good be evil spoken of. So be careful the kind of people that you associate with because their behavior can rub off on you and can affect you. Let me illustrate it this way. Liquor and alcohol has never been an issue for me. I've never desired it. It's never been. I've seen what it's done to people all my life, and I, I have never had a desire for it. I've never had. A, I've never opened. I've never opened a bottle or a can of beer in my life. Amen. I never had. I have no idea what it tastes like. Some of you have. You know what it tastes like. You know what it does. Here. I've never done it. My dad, and mom, they never had it in the home. They would not allow it in the home. 
And I grew up, my wife grew up in a Christian family. We've never had it. It's, it's not been an issue for us. But if it was an issue for me, I'm not going to sit in the bar downtown and try to make friends. Do you know why? Because the evil influence can rub off on a person, especially when they're weak. And so, therefore, the well-behaved Christian fully surrendered, and he also cultivates friends of whom God approves. Our life and testimony for Christ can be made or marred by the kind of people we associate with. So what kind of friends should we choose? Look at verse number 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. I think verse 6 gives us the answer. We're to cultivate the friendship and fellowship of those who honor God, love the Lord Jesus, and make much of the house of God, the word of God, and the services of God. We ought to come to worship together and meet friends. Do you want to know why we have life groups? That we might study the Bible and make friends. Do you want to know why we have Sunday school? That we might study the Bible and make friends. Do you want to know why the Golden Seniors are going to BD's Mongolian Grill this coming Tuesday? I know why I'm going. <laughs> it's one of my favorite places to go to. I want to be a witness for Jesus at BD's this week. But you get, watch them get their food and they'll sit there and talk to each other. They're being friends. God's people ought to make friends. And when you come together and have something in common with a believer in the church house, it's easy to become friends because some people do not make friends real easy. Amen. You know why we have a youth group? Sometimes the young people will come into the classroom and they'll think, I'm bashful and I'm backward and I can't talk. That's why those other teens and those other youth groups need to make friends. I'm stopping on that part, but I'm going to do number seven, and I'm done. Let me just stop on that part. I've got some more things I want to say. Number seven, the last point in the message. The well-behaved Christian has a controlled tongue. I really didn't want to cover this one. Look at verse five. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Verse 5, David tells us that he's determined not to be a, par a party to slander, to false and malicious reports. Now, before, before we pass on any news, good, meaty gossip news, we need to ask ourselves some questions. Here they go. We'll put them on the PowerPoint for me. One at a time, please. Is it true? You know, sometimes it's just good to get some information that you think nobody else has. And whether it's true or not, before you even check it out, you can't hardly wait to tell it. You say, Pastor, how do you know? I just happen to know. We all have something that we think nobody else knows, and we just can't wait to tell it. So we ought to find out, is it true? Many years ago, I will tell you this story, and it was sort of, sort of funny how it happened, but I was working a funeral service with the O.R. Woodyard Funeral Company. And my sister called me on my cell phone and she said, Tim, she said, Dad is not doing well and we're taking him to the hospital. And so I said, well, I'm in a funeral right now. As a matter of fact, I'm riding down the road in a hearse with a funeral director. And I said, as soon as I can get back to the funeral home and get in my car, I'll just head right up to Mansfield to meet you all at the hospital. And they were fine with that. So I thought, I better get people praying. So I started the prayer chain. Before it got done, here's what it said. Pastor Tim's dad passed away. He was riding in the hearse all the way back from the cemetery. We ought to be praying for Pastor Tim. Now, you know the old telephone story? I really believe we've got to be careful what we say because people listen to what we say. Number two, is it necessary to say it? I know you can look at me and say, Pastor, you look like you've gained some weight. But do you think that's encouraging to me when you say it? Is it necessary to say everything that you know? Did you get what I just said? Is it necessary for you to say everything that you know? For some it may not take long, but is it necessary that we say everything we know? Number three, will it help you to say it? Will it help to say it? 
Will it help the people that you're talking to if you tell them something that you probably shouldn't tell them? Number four, will it harm or will it glorify God? Number five, am I helped by saying it? Number six, is it my business anyway? They just, some things people want to talk about and they, it doesn't even matter. It is not their business. So what's the secret to the well-behaved Christian life? I think the answer is in verse two. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Let me give this to you in the Holman Christian Standard Bible this morning. I will pay attention to the way of integrity. When will you, God, come to me? I will live with a heart of integrity in my house. Why? Because the Lord lives in the house. You see, he hears what's said in your house. He hears what you're saying. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're watching. He knows what you're doing. The Bible is saying simply, Lord, I will pay attention to the way of integrity because I know you are in the house. Not only is he at church. I mean, we we do our best to look good in church and to act good and to sing the songs and to smile and all that. It's like the man and his wife and the kids that are pulling into the churchyard and they fought all the way from the house to the church parking lot. And finally, the husband says to the wife, y'all need to sit down and shut up. Say, we're pulling into the church now. Put on a smile. There's the preacher. You say, how do you know what happens? I just happen to know. Are you with me this morning? I'm just trying to give you some things to help you behave yourself. So there's two things that has to be looked at. First of all, there must be a determined resolve. Here's the application. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. If I'm going to behave myself, I've got to be careful about everything I say, everything I do, and where I go. Because someone may see me, even in all innocence, and misunderstand I have to be careful what I do, what I say, where I go. And second of all, there must be a deep consciousness that it is only possible to be a well-behaved as the Lord himself comes and dwells within us, empowering us and enabling us. In other words, when will you come to me is what David's saying. When will you come into me, Lord, and, and I want to be ready for you. Now, I, I'm going to tell you this. This afternoon, my family's coming over for Sunday dinner. We enjoy our family coming over for Sunday dinner. We, we, we like that. But if we had somebody special outside the family coming over today, I probably would not have used the subway napkins that I had left over. I would get the paper towels out and I'd good, put the good jelly jars away. And we'll get the little goblets out. You say, Pastor, you're crazy. That's all right. Leave me alone. I'm just simply saying when you have the best coming over, you want to make a good impression. And what David is saying, telling us in this passage is, Lord, when are you coming over? When are you going to stop by and visit? And isn't that the way it should be even right here today? Right here in the house of God? Didn't you come to church expecting God to visit with you today in the church? Amen. So you have to come with a heart full of integrity and a heart of character, a heart of just saying, God, I want you to do something within me. As I prepared to close the message, there was a couple of things I read just trying to get my own thoughts to where I knew I could preach this message. And I came across a book, an illustration about a book named titled I Surrender. Patrick Morley writes that the church's integrity problem is in the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract the sin. And in that he said it is a change in belief without a change in behavior. There's people who come to an altar and they say, I now believe God, but they don't change the way they live. And I'm really concerned that when we come and say, yes, I believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, so I believe the gospel, I'm saved. There has to be that element in there of Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5, when Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So we've got to look inside of our own heart and say, God, I want you to reveal these things to me that I can say I'm sorry for those things in my life that are not right. The Lord cleans what he catches. If there's not a change within our heart, if there's not a change within our hearts, I wonder if we really got saved. The second thing I saw in that illustration was the next statement summed up our recent series, which I've just been preaching revival. He goes on to say, Patrick Morley says, it, it is revival without reformation 
and without repentance. It's coming together for those services, but not really wanting to repent of our sins and let God do something. And revival will never happen unless we have repentance. So I found an old song, and Jacob gave my story away the other day. I like to sing when I do my devotions. And sometimes I sing a song, and I'll just sing it all day long. And this one I came across, you probably recognize the last line of the verse. Guide my feet, precious Lord, when I'm tempted and tried. In thy sheltering fold, let me safely hide. For one little step is too far from thy side. I want to walk as close as I possibly can. Possibly can. Let's stand for prayer. Father, I want to thank you for allowing me to preach this morning. I, I believe, Lord, as you've given me something to say, and I've tried to say it, and I, I've tried to help us to understand the passage before us. Lord, I just want to, I want to say in my own personal prayer, and I know it publicly it's being heard, but Lord, I want you just to search my heart out, and it's you and me right now, Lord, just you and me. And uh, uh, forgive me of my sins. And uh, Lord, look inside my heart, and I want you to cleanse me that you might always be able to use me for your glory. And I pray, Lord, that all of us in this room would be able to say that from our hearts today. Uh, we ask you, Lord, to help us to have the right kind of behavior, the right kind of uh, life that people might see Christ in us and that you might be glorified. We're just reflectors of that great light. But Lord, help us to live like we're not ashamed of Jesus. Help us to live in a way that it pleases our Lord. Help us, Father, to have the right behavior, to behave ourselves. People are watching. People are watching. They hear what we say. They see what we do. Help us to be careful what we say and do, I pray. And Lord, for that one or two or those in the service that are not saved, I pray for their soul. I ask you, God, to speak to hearts now. Thank you that you paid the debt for our sins. And if we could come and believe you, repent of our sins and trust you for that great salvation. I pray now that you'll speak to all of us. If every man, woman, boy, or girl do what you speak to them about today, I pray. Our heads are still bowed and eyes are closed for just a moment. Till Ben's going to play softly on the piano. Maybe this morning God has spoken to your heart. Maybe you're not a Christian and you'd like to get saved. And maybe this morning in your own heart there's some things that you just feel like you're out of tune with God, out of touch with God. and Maybe your behavior has not been that which is really exemplary for God. You're not exemplifying life, the life of Christ. And God just begin to speak to your heart about some things. I won't embarrass you. I'll not call your name out, but I'll give you a chance to just slip your hand up with mine and say by that, Pastor, I, I need you to pray for me. God knows my heart. God bless you. God bless your hearts. God bless you today, dear friends. Oh, my heart is touched that you'd be that honest and just slip your hand up and say, pray for me. God bless your hearts. Oh, dear friend, bless your hearts. Are there others this morning? I just need you to pray for me. God bless you. God sees who you are. He knows your heart. You've raised your hand, and I can't see your heart, but God has seen that heart. This morning, you want to come and pray. Why don't you just step on out from where you're at, and don't be ashamed. Just come on, and let's talk to the Lord this morning. and Let God do in your heart what he wants to do. Father, would you speak and help us to respond, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll stand down here in the front this morning. If you'd like to come and share your request with me, I'll be glad to pray with you as well. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. I'd like to come and pray this morning. It's God Jesus speaking to you. You come along and talk to the Lord with you this morning. There's nothing be glad to pray for you. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that His blessed song. face may be seen. Nothing prevented the least of His favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing be I'm just going to play softly. I just want to speak to you for a moment, then we're going to have closing prayer. God knows what you are. God knows what I am. 
God knows all the mistakes that I've ever made. God knows all the mistakes you've ever made that are not under the blood. But it's under the blood. It's washed away. Understand that. That's a great hope, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? Under the blood, it's all wiped away. I'm so thrilled about that. But those things that we've not talked to God about, all of our weaknesses, all those things that concern us, we can bring to the Lord, and He gives us that help. He gives us that grace and that mercy. He takes care of all of that. God knows what you are when nobody else is around. He knows what you think. He knows what you say. Sometimes I've been, I, I, sometimes I've had a little bit of a temper. Sometimes I've said things I wish to goodness I'd have never said. Sometimes I've done things I wish I'd have never done. Every one of us are there. But I'm so glad God's grace allows nothing to come between. If you don't know him, you can know him. And I'm going to tell you from my heart, there's nothing any sweeter than knowing Christ and knowing that I'm right with God. I'm right with God. Are you sure of that this morning? Just the course, Jacob, just the course. Let's sing it together, just the course. Nothing between my soul and my Savior So that His blessed face may be seen Nothing preventing the least of His favor Keep the way clear, let nothing be between. Thank you so much for your presence in the house of the Lord. Don't forget Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, chances to study the Bible, to become friends with people that you may not know. All right? On the back of your bulletin is all those opportunities for life groups. On the inside of your bulletin is all the announcements of what's going on this week. Take time to to live for Christ and take time to let your behavior exemplify Christ and come be with us anytime that you can. I'm glad you're here this morning. Are you glad you came to church today? Amen. Boy, that was good. I was scared to death. You're going to be real quiet this time. All right. Dr. Lovelace, are you still there? Is he, are you able to lead us in a closing prayer, my friend?